All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's Planning Commission meeting. Today's date is May 25th, 2022, and the time is 9.30 a.m. Today's meeting is completely remote via Zoom. There are a couple of ways to participate in today's meeting. If your computer is equipped with a microphone, it is recommended that you participate via the Planning Commission Zoom link, which is posted on the Planning Department's homepage at sccoplanning.com. Alternatively, if your computer is not equipped with a microphone, you may provide comment by telephone. The phone number is 669-900-6833. The collaboration code is 834-093-107. This, if, this information is also posted on our website, in case you forget. During key points in today's meeting, time will be provided for members of the public to provide their testimony. Speakers will be muted until called on to speak. I will ask participants who wish to provide testimony to either remotely raise their hand by selecting the hand icon on the Zoom link, or if you're calling in by telephone, by remotely raising your hand by pressing star nine. I will call on participants by either your name or the last four digits of your telephone number. If participating via the Zoom link, when I call on you to speak, you'll see a pop-up on your screen that says unmute. Please accept the pop-up, state your name for the record and provide your testimony. If calling in via telephone, you must unmute yourself by pressing star six. And I will remind everybody of these um, commands later in the meeting. If at any time you have difficulty connecting to today's meeting via the Zoom link or by calling in via telephone, please email Michael Lamb at michael.lamb, that's L-A-M, at santacruzcounty.us. He will be checking his email periodically throughout the meeting and he is ready to assist anyone who has difficulty. And those are the instructions. Looks like we have the planning commissioners with us today. I will now turn it over to the Planning Commission Chair, Tim Gordon. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Jocelyn. Thank you so much for the intro, appreciate it. And uh, good morning, everyone. Today is uh, May 25th and I welcome everyone to the, this hearing of the Santa Cruz County Planning Commission. It's 932 and we can call this meeting to order. Could we please start with a roll call, Ms. Drake? Yes. Commissioner Dan? Here. Commissioner Lazenby? Here. Commissioner Violante? Here. All right, Commissioner Shepard. Did not see her earlier. Not present at this time. And Chair Gordon? Here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, do we, moving on to item, agenda item two, do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda today? No, not today, Chair. Okay, great. Um, item number three, declaration of ex parte communications. Do any commissioners have anything to declare today? Okay, none today, great. Moving along, oral communications, item number four. This is the time when the members of the public have an opportunity to speak on items that are not on today's agenda. Um, Ms. Drake, do you have any members of the public that would like to speak at this time? All right, Chair, I'm seeing one hand raised and um, the phone number is 2915. Good morning, please state your name for the record. You have two minutes. Good morning. 
morning. This is Becky Steinbruner. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Becky. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I would like to make your commission aware that there is um, Santa Cruz County plan working under the of state mandate put in place by legislation known as SB 552 that will um, require the county to come up with a plan regarding consolidation of domestic and small water systems. Part of a, a required drought response plan. And um, I want to make your commission aware of that work that is ongoing and has to be done by October to present to the Board of Supervisors and then ultimately to the State Water Board by the end of the year. I think this is a, a big, uh, big step in our county and kind of a heavy hand by the state. Um, I'm quite concerned about it, but um, it, it fits sort of hand in glove with what we see as the uh, state mandates for RENA numbers requiring large uh, numbers of, of how residential units to be built. Um, but we still have this issue of water supply. So I see this move to consolidate as a way to address that issue, water availability, simply combining larger systems, smaller systems, private well owners to uh, make water, in essence, available. I'm concerned about that, and I just want to make your aware of that work ongoing. Santa Cruz County LAFCO also is in the process of doing a very extensive sphere and service review report of the water uh, purveyors in Santa Cruz County, and that report will be due out in August. So watch for that. Um, Thank you, Becky. Toronto is very thorough. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on an item that is not on today's agenda? If so, please press your um, press star nine on your telephone or raise your hand if you're using the Zoom link. And I am not seeing any other hands raised. Chair, so I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much. And um, so then we can close the oral communications portion of the hearing and move on to our next item, approval of the minutes from the last meeting. And um, would any commissioners like to make comments on the minutes or uh, a motion? This is Commissioner Lazenby and I will move approval of the minutes. Thank you, Commissioner Lazenby. Um, I can second that. I was here. Um, however, so we can take a vote on this. Ms. Drake, I'm, a, I'm not sure on this one because two commissioners were not here last week unless they reviewed it and could approve it. I um, was if present at the meeting, although yeah. I wasn't, yes. Okay, great. Okay, great, so we have enough. Um, so then at this point we can, <clears throat> excuse me, take a uh, vote on the motion. And all those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstain? Commissioner Dan abstain. Thank you. So with that, the motion passes. Thank you. And we can move on to agenda item number six. Um, this is a study session to consider the sustainability policy and regulatory update. Uh, this is a, just to make sure everyone on, in the public's aware and kind of talk about the process a little bit more globally. This is the first in a, in a number of study sessions that we're going to have to look at the new sustainability update. Um, we'll talk about schedule of the upcoming meetings later in the agenda. Um, just want to you know, state up front, we're not really sure how long this might take. It might be pretty lengthy at times and some other times maybe not as, as much. However, today we do wanna make sure we 
work in a, a lunch break at 11.30. So if we end up going that long, we'll take a break right at 11.30 uh, for a 30 minute lunch. And then I just wanted to be clear on the study sessions for the public in particular that it's going to kind of go in this order. We're going to, <clears throat> excuse me, hear a presentation from planning department staff. And then it comes back to the commission for discussion and immediate questions. Then we'll hear public comment today public comment portion will be given three minutes per person to speak after that we'll bring it back to the commission for final discussion and then there's no action needed on today's agenda item it's informational and, and just a study session so just so everyone in the public understands kind of how this process works on these uh, that's what we'll be doing and correct me if i'm wrong jocelyn but otherwise uh, i appreciate a staff report this time that sounded good we have natisha williams with us this morning um and I believe she will be providing a PowerPoint presentation. Good morning, Natisha. Good morning, commissioners, Jocelyn. I'm actually going to get us started this morning. This is Stephanie Hansen, assistant director in the new um, CDI, Community Development and Infrastructure Department. Um, I've been working with the sustainability and special projects or policy team. I think we're shifting to that um, for about four years um, on getting this project launched and out to the um, uh, into the world. And we're very happy to be here today um, for, as, as Chair Gordon mentioned, the first of several study sessions. Um, with me today is Natisha Williams. She's a senior planner with our group and she's going to help me present uh, the material today. Um, uh, we'd appreciate if we could kind of get through the presentation and then we'll answer any um, commissioner questions that, that come up. Um, uh, today's um, uh, session is really an overview of the whole project where um, we're deferring kind of the details of the general plan and the code to the upcoming sessions and we'll review a schedule of those sessions um, uh, in in the presentation today. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that our project team also consists of um, Annie Murphy, who is with us uh, today on the call and will be able to help answer any questions. And Anais Shank, um, who specializes in transportation, will also be able to help us with any questions that come up on those items. Um, along the way, we've received a lot of help and feedback from other county divisions. Um, uh, we want to recognize uh, Michaela Lopez in the housing division for all the help with the Spanish translations. Um, the design guidelines were created by uh, a design firm called MIG, who helped with uh, the pleasure point work a couple of years ago. Um, and also county staff uh, worked on that quite a bit. The EIR is being uh, prepared by another consultant, DUDEC, and our transportation consultant has been Kimley Horn. Next slide. <clears throat> um, as I mentioned, this uh, presentation is the first of um, several that we're going to be conducting with the commission this spring. Um, the purpose will be to start with the background and vision for the project to kind of get us all on the same um, page with what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, and we'll follow a discussion on kind of key topic areas and an overview of the EIR. Um, we'll discuss project outreach and schedule and provide some additional resources. On June 8th, we'll return to the commission with the um, built environment element uh, and the design guidelines and amendments related to uh, the county code and uh, zoning maps. Generally, that'll be about kind of residential and commercial development. On June 22nd, we'll be discussing transportation and parks and recreation and public facilities. And on July 13th, uh, we're scheduling uh, the code modernization program agriculture and resources and an overview of the draft EIR.
The sustainability update has four main components, amendments to the general plan, which includes our local coastal program, amendments to the county code, um, uh, new uh, county design guidelines to, to help with new development, and amendments to our land use and zoning maps. We'll discuss each of these components in more detail in this presentation. The sustainability update uh, project has several key goals. First, the project implements the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan. This is a planning study that was adopted by, or excuse me, accepted by the Board of Supervisors in 2014. Second, the project aims to update, streamline, and modernize the zoning code and other related county code sections. This project also addresses projected growth. Um, Santa Cruz County, like all California jurisdictions, is required under state planning law to plan for and accommodate a certain amount of population, housing, and economic growth. So this uh, update of the general plan anticipates a 20-year growth period from 2020 to 2040. Um, and finally, consistency with newly adopted county plans and new state legislation also informs the project. Planning law requires jurisdictions to reflect and be consistent with a variety of state laws, as well as regional plans adopted for the area. And if the jurisdiction is near the coast, the California Coastal Act. At the local level, the project will be consistent with the county's strategic plan, the climate action strategy, economic vitality study, our park strategic plan, and the current uh, Department of Public Works Capital Improvement Program, as, long, uh, as well as our long range facilities plan and the public works design criteria. Project is also consistent with the recently adopted um, active transportation plan uh, for Santa Cruz County it focuses on uh, pedestrian and bicycle facility needs. At the regional level, the project is consistent with the Association of Monterey Bay Government's Sustainable Communities Plan, as well as the Regional Transportation Commission's Re Regional Transportation Plan. At the state level, we're meeting guidelines for SB 375, Sustainable Communities, uh, the Complete Streets Bill, a Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and current state requirements for general plans that um, now include environmental justice requirements. Those are new and we'll talk more about that. And then um, additionally, the project is consistent with the Coastal Act and the California Coastal Commission Strategic Plan. By way of background, the Sustainable Santa Cruz Plan focused mostly on new development in the county's coastal urban areas, particularly our higher growth areas of Live Oak and Soquel. The plan was accepted in 2014. The development of the plan involved intensive public participation and a very intensive visioning process. A series of 16 community workshops were held throughout the county between 2012 and 2014. The topics of those meetings included overall vision, as well as plans for certain focus areas. Um, there was also advisory groups, business involvement, and many stakeholder interviews. The result of these meetings was a vision for urban development in Santa Cruz County and guiding principles to achieve that vision. These guiding principles have been carried over into the new draft general plan. They address um, issues and goals such as focused development, transportation choices, open space, housing options, economic vitality, inclusive decision making, unique community character, uh, governmental coordination, and fiscal responsibility. The Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan also resulted in recommendations for land use and transportation. These are carried over into the, our sustainability update project as well. These include concentrating infill development within the urban services line near transportation corridors and high activity areas, develop, developing a multimodal transportation network, which we will get into in an upcoming meeting a little bit more. 
updating development reviews to consider vehicle miles traveled, as well as modern parking standards, establishing new zone districts and standards to encourage multifamily housing and mixed use and modern workplace. Um, and supporting the development of medical facilities, particularly along the Soquel Drive uh, corridor. The project um, also incorporates um, the code modernization effort that began in 2013. The code was originally adopted in the 1950s and it's been updated in a piecemeal fashion, which has led to real complications um, in the code. Uh, complex land use requirements and so forth. Um, so as a result, land use regulations have become increasingly complex. And so uh, part of this project is aimed at, at simplifying the process a bit. In 2014, we recognized the need to make county code regulations more user friendly. And county staff engaged with the community um, to identify how the code could be, um, could be improved to better serve the public. In particular, we identified a need to update the county's development permit framework, as well as a need to modernize very ag various agricultural regulations um, and to reflect modern needs and practices. There was a series of community meetings that were held then um, throughout the county to further refine these regulations. Uh, in 2015 and 2016, the, the Board of Supervisors reviewed a number of the draft regulations um, related to the new permit framework, agricultural re regulations, and establishment of new standards and zone districts um, that have been identified in the Sustainable Santa Cruz County Plan um, and directed staff to continue to work on these amendments and um, combine them into a complete project and um, address them in, in the upcoming environmental impact report. So this project fulfills that board direction. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Natisha and she's going to delve into the amendments a little bit more. Thanks, Stephanie. All right, so um, amendments to the general plan include a new introduction, land use, and circulation elements that incorporate a new emphasis on sustainability, as well as integration of the vision and guiding principles that Stephanie just went over, um, and the land use and transportation recommendations from the SSCC. Um, it also includes new population, housing, and employment targets for 2040, as well as an integrated, uh, integrated strategies and policies from various local, regional, and state plans and regulations. The land use element was renamed the built environment element and integrates existing chapters 2, land use, and chapter 8, community design, with a focus on residential and commercial development. The built environment element includes a new urban high density flex residential designation. And this new RUHF designation accommodates a greater intensity of residences along and near transportation corridors and key activity centers within the county's urban services line, creating um, some opportunities for infill housing available to residents at various income levels and household sizes. These and other key policies related to the built environment will be reviewed in greater detail at the next Planning Commission study session that's scheduled for June 8th. The circulation element, uh, Chapter 3 of the general plan, is being renamed Access and Mobility to reflect a focus on movement of people rather than the movement of vehicles. The chapter includes a new layered transportation network um, concept that priori prioritizes certain types of users on um, specific streets. And this layering approach provides a greater quality, um, higher quality experience than an approach that would attempt to accommodate everyone within a limited space. This element addresses all kinds of transportation modes, transit, micro mobility, pedestrians and bicycl bicyclists, and a new list of transportation system improvements to guide future projects. The concepts of the built environment element are strongly linked to the transportation concepts and the access and mobility element um, in order to focus new development along these transportation corridors and promote the goals of sustainable development. The project also partially amends chapter five, conservation and open space, which has been renamed agriculture resources and conservation. 
And the changes in this chapter focus on updating agricultural timber and water and groundwater policies. Partial amendments are also proposed for chapter seven, the parks, recreation and public facilities element uh, to be consistent with the park strategic plan and to ensure that county facilities are adequate to accommodate projected growth. And we'll be going um, into greater detail on the new policies and regulations related to transportation, parks, and public facilities at the third study session, which is scheduled for June 22nd. And new agriculture and resource policies will be covered in the fourth study session scheduled for July 13th. Other general plan chapters will not be changed substantively, if at all, and these chapters include chapter four, housing, which is scheduled to be amended in 2023. Chapter six, public safety, which was amended by the board in 2020 based on the commission's recommendations and is currently pending certification by the Coastal Commission. And chapter nine, noise, which was uh, amended in 2019. The second component of the project is amendments to the county code. These amendments include updates to title 12 building, uh, Title 13 planning and zoning regulations, which includes changes to zoning, design, and coastal regulation chapters, as well as a new parking and circulation chapter, and Title 18 procedures. And there's also some small associated changes in Titles 5 and 15 of the code. Key changes to the code include a new permit system that replaces the current processing levels with more descriptive permit names that are commonly used in other communities. Um, there's also the creation of the new residential flex zone district to implement the RUHF the land use designation from the general plan. And there's a new uh, workplace flex zone district C3 that provides centers of employment with a flexible mixture of commercial and light industrial land uses to meet the daily needs of workers. And code, code updates also include new agriculture and event regulations, um, revised design review standards, and revised development standards for several districts, including new mixed use standards. Overall, all these codes, code amendments serve to both modernize the code and align with the changes being made to the general plan, LCP. And updates related to the new zoning districts will be reviewed in greater detail at the next study session on June 8th. And code modernization will re be reviewed in greater detail at the fourth study session scheduled for July 13th. The project um, also includes the adoption of new Santa Cruz County design guidelines. The guidelines include best practices for building design, site development, and connecting private development to the streetscape. And this document is intended to guide the design of all projects, but especially focuses on multifamily residential and commercial development in the urban area. Um, there's also design guidelines specifically for the Pleasure Point Commercial Corridor, which is included as an appendix to this document. And finally, the project includes targeted land use changes and rezoning on 23 parcels located throughout the county. And there's two types of land use changes. The first type um, are amendments to eliminate inconsistencies between the general plan maps and the zoning maps. And this is um, for 13 parcels. The county is required uh, by state law to ensure consistency between the general plan land use designations and the zoning maps. Um, so no in intens intensification of land use is proposed as a result of these corrections. The second type of map amendments includes targeted rezoning of 10 key opportunity sites along transportation corridors to implement the new RUH uh, residential flex uh, general plan designation and the new residential flex zone district. And we'll be providing more detail on these map amendments as well as the design guidelines at the next study session on June 8th. So this slide indicates the overall focus growth strategy of the sustainability update. Growth is focused within the urban services line, which is indicated in blue. In the unincorporated coastal urban area, growth is planned around key transportation corridors and outside of this urban area, the county's open space, agriculture, and rural residential lands would continue to be protected. Sustainable development is envisioned in this project, um, as envisioned in this project, is built on the three pillars of sustainability, environment, economy, and equity. 
and overall the sustainability update plans for development that can accommodate the county's projected growth while maintaining and improving the environment, economy, and quality of life for those who live and work here. Like all jurisdictions, the county will grow in the next 20 years and beyond, and the general plan built environment element, county code, Santa Cruz County design guidelines plan for this growth by applying sustainable design principles to all scales of development from the regional scale down to the build, individual buildings and sites. And like Stephanie mentioned earlier, environmental justice is a new topic area that must be incorporated into general plans in California, either as a se separate chapter or as policies within each chapter uh, per recent state law. This important topic is addressed throughout the general plan with policies addressing environmental justice, topics denoted with EJ, and, and it's also listed in general plan appendix E. Environmental justice means equitable protection from environmental and health hazards for everyone. Environmental justice themes that are addressed with the new general plan policies include pollution exposure and air quality, equitable access to safe and sanitary homes, food, transportation, and other public services and facilities, physical activity opportunities and community engagement opportunities, as well as improvements and programs that address the needs of disadvantaged communities. And disadvantaged communities are populations that are disproportionately affected by environmental pollution or hazards, have high concentrations of low income, high rates of employment, low levels of home, home ownership, high rent burden, sensitive populations, or low levels of educational attainment. The county used uh, several definitions when mapping disadvantaged communities so as to be as inclusive as possible. And the county's disadvantaged communities are primarily located um, around Watsonville and Live Oak, as you can see from this map on this slide, which uh, can, this map can also be found in the general plan, chapter two, figure 2-13. Additional fringe or legacies communities uh, located in Davenport and along Highway 9 and outside of city borders have the potential to be defined as disadvantaged communities as well, based on environmental and resource issues. As required by state law, the county has prepared an environmental impact report or EIR to analyze the impacts of the sustainability update projects. The EIR analyzes topics as required by the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. Some topics that need special evaluation in the EIR include addressing impacts to aesthetics, agriculture, cultural resources, land use, population and housing, public services and utilities, water supply and groundwater and transportation. And we'll review these in more detail um, along with significant impacts of the project uh, on, at the fourth study session scheduled for July 13th. The document evaluates transportation impacts in terms of vehicle miles traveled or VMT as required by CEQA. VMT is a measurement of the number of miles that people are traveling in vehicles and is a metric related to the production of greenhouse gases. But operational information like um, levels of service is also provided for informational purposes, although we're no longer able to consider operational impacts as CEQA impacts. The draft EIR was released on April 14th and made available for public review and comment on the county's CEQA document website at the address on this slide. And hard copies are also available on the fourth floor of the county building located at 701 Ocean Street, as well as select libraries throughout the county. And these doc documents will remain available through the 45 day comment period, which ends on May 31st at 5 p.m. After the comment period, a final EIR will be prepared to address any comments prior to adoption of the amendments. And now Stephanie will review a little bit about the public outreach conducted for the project and the project schedule. Thank you, Natisha. Um, we just wanted to kind of review the, the resources that are available to the public and the commission. Um, the best way for the public to become more familiar with this project is through the project website. Um, current drafts of the general plan chapters, county code design guidelines and map amendments are all available on that web page. 
Um, hard copies of project documents are also available for review at the county building, fourth floor, as well as the um, downtown and Capitola libraries. The what's included page on the website provides a summary of proposed amendments by project document. And you can also find changes organized by topic um, and corresponding fact sheets on eight uh, topic areas. The fact sheets highlight key policies and provide reference to the documents that um, address those um, policies. And the fact sheets are also available in Spanish. A project survey was launched um, in early March in order to gain feedback from the public on policy specific um, uh, topics and on key changes within topic areas with links to more information on the website. Um, as of March 13th, the county had received 142 surveys and the results are included in uh, exhibit C of your packet. The project website also includes a comment portal, um, which provides an open forum for the public to submit their comments on the project. Um, to date, 50 comments have been received, um, uh, either through the portal or through email. Um, uh, sorry, there's a 50 comments through the email and 22 comments through the uh, portal, and they continue to come in. These are included in your packet as exhibits A and B. We also launched a social media campaign um, and email outreach has been extensive since the project documents were released in February. Um, each of those emails um, that you probably hopefully receive um, are going out to more than 3000 people every time. Um, the list includes uh, stakeholder groups, local agencies, community organizations, and those who have asked to be on our um, email lists. Seven uh, evening community meetings were held this spring that focused on various project topics. Community meetings had over 160 attendees and summaries of questions and comments from each meeting have been attached to the staff report as exhibit D. Several polls were released during the meeting to engage the community members and collect public feedback on specific policy topics. And poll questions and responses are also included in exhibit D. All of the meetings um, are recorded and available on um, the project website on the Get Involved page, including Spanish translations for the first two meetings. Um, finally, project staff can be emailed at any time at the email shown on this slide. Uh, now, just a minute on our um, schedule. Um, we wanted to um, show you the timeline for the project. Um, the amendments were made available to the public at the end of February, um, and project documents are available for review now, as we've mentioned. Um, in addition to these study sessions, we had the, um, we're also uh, doing study sessions at various county commissions, including the Housing Advisory Commission and the Latino Affairs Commission. Um, which will be pre presented in Spanish a uh, week from today on June 1st. Study sessions um, will continue through the summer. Following these sessions, the final EIR will be prepared and this EIR will address the public comments that were collected um, during the comment period on the draft EIR. Um, and then after that, we'll return to your commission in August for public hearings and a formal recommendation to the Board of Supervisors. Um, the Board of Supervisors hearings are scheduled to be held um, in October through December. Um, and after adoption at the board, most of the amendments will need to go to the um, Coastal Commission for certification because they're part of our LCP. Uh, so our recommendation today was to conduct a, a study session and receive an overview of this project. Um, we also wanted to confirm the schedule of additional study sessions and public hearings for the amendments. Uh, study sessions are today, June 8th, July 13th, and I think there's a typo on there. The June 22 is not correct. Um, 
And then we're looking at two scheduled public hearings, August 24th and September 14th, um, before the project would go to the um, board. So that's the overview. And we're um, happy to answer any questions that the commission may have. Um, but um, just noting that we'll get into a lot more detail on the individual topic areas at the upcoming um, at the upcoming study sessions. So thank you very much, and um, we're happy to, as I said, answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Stephanie and Natisha. That was really good, and I know this is so much information, and it's hard to consolidate. But you did an awesome job, and it's really clear, it cleared up a lot of questions that I had already. So I'm just really grateful for hard work and the great presentation. Um, do any of the commissioners want to uh, ask any specific questions now um, before you go to any public comment? Commissioner Dan? Yeah, did you just say that there is no study session on June 22nd? So the, the June 22nd date is correct. It's just in the wrong order. Okay. Um, and then, <laughs> Are there a lot of members of the public that want to speak? If so, I'll wait. I'll hold my questions and comments and hear from the public. I'm not seeing uh, a great deal of members of the public with us so far. I'd be happy to hold off on my questions. Also, if, if we wanted to let members of the public go, and then we can talk. We might have a lengthy conversation here if we get into it. Um, okay. Would other commissioners be all right with that? Great. Let's let's do that. Let's move to uh, public comment and just let the public speak, and then we can move on from there. Um, this uh, just a reminder: members of the public have three minutes to speak on this topic today. Um, and Chair Gordon, if I may, before yes. I move over to. Um, uh, calling on members of the public if you wouldn't mind working on dropping one of your connections to the meeting we okay. are only seeing your photo um because you're oh, connected twice yeah yeah so if you Sorry. can disconnect from one of your um one of your um devices then it'll run the the video feed because okay. right now we're just seeing your photo put you Thanks. on my phone here <laughs> okay because my computer didn't think I had a microphone today. Loves to do that to me. So give me one sec here. That would be great. And I Thank will, um, while you're working on that, maybe we'll hear from the members of the public. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. So just wanted to remind folks that if you wish to provide comment on what you heard today um, on the sustainability update, to raise your hand by pressing star nine on your telephone or remotely, um, or raising your hand using the hand icon on Teams or uh, Zoom, sorry. Okay, I am seeing a hand raised with the last four digits of 2915 again. So um, please restate your name for the record, even though we have heard from you previously and you have three minutes now to speak. Good morning. Good morning again. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Becky. Thank you. Um, thank you for this this um, overview. I am concerned that the EIR public comment time will close next Tuesday before your commission even has the opportunity to review it publicly and to um, provide your input. So. I and I know other people have also e requested an extension of public comment time for the EIR. Hopefully it will be past the July 6th uh, Planning Commission study session for that topic. Um, but I really hope that the public comment time will be extended because this is a lot and the EIR is even more. So um, I'm hoping that will that the public will be accommodated. I would like to um, request, and I did this in the public meetings that were held um, earlier this spring, 
the maps shown in the the document are very difficult to read. Um, in your slide today, slide number three, that is difficult to really understand where those areas are for the intensive development. I would, re would request again that there be magnified maps or larger versions or, or cutouts of them somehow that will help the public better identify where these areas will be. I'm also interested in knowing the exact locations of these 10 parcels that you described that are being dis um, um, targeted for the, the new ResFlex um, in development. Um, in this, uh, and I know this will get into the um, transportation session more, but again, I am becoming more aware of the number of people in our community that that walk, that are blind, or have uh, visual impairments. And so I'm asking again that the there be in this work some type of requirement for standardization of pedestrian crosswalk signals, that they are in the same lo location within the intersections, that they have a sound so that they can be located, that there is some regulation in terms of the volume so that they are not turned down uh, to the point that they cannot be audible over traffic noise. Um, and also, I've, I've got some concerns about uh, uh, that and the, the Dutch design for the intersection, which will come up later. In closing, I see um, on my screen, I can see the screen, but I can't hear you, so I'm coming in on telephone for audio, that this is being recorded. And I want to confirm that and that this recording of today's meeting will be put on your website for those who cannot be here today. Um, I think that concludes my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. All right. Um, going back to the attendees, again, if you wish to comment on this study session item today, please raise your hand um, on your phone by pressing star nine or the hand icon on the Zoom app. Hmm. I'm not seeing any additional hands raised at this time, Chair. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's let me see. Uh, we well, first off, we can close the public comment portion then, and I'm going to try and get my tech fixed here. And let me see if this works. <laughs> okay, can you see me now? It looks like we can. Yes. Okay. There we go. Thanks. Sorry. I could see myself on the other screen, so I didn't realize that um, no one could see me. I apologize for that. Um, okay, great. So then we can bring it back to the commission at this time for further questions and discussion and um, go from there. Do any commissioners uh, want to get started? I can be brave and go first. Okay. Oh, and Commissioner Lazenby, did you, did you, were you ready to go? No, no, go ahead. Um, so I just, I wanna thank staff, first of all, um, for the enormous amount of work um, that's gone into this project. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend virtually um, or watch online the, um, the public meetings that we had beginning, I think in March. And I just wanna thank you for making them so convenient to watch um, kind of on your own time whenever it was convenient. So I feel like I've gotten a pretty good general overview with those um, coupled with today. And it's an enormous amount of material. And so um, I will just say that I've only begun to really dig into the details. And so some of my questions I'm really gonna hold off until the next study sessions when I've actually had a chance to read the details and not waste your time asking questions that are actually in the in the documents. Um, 
And then, so I'll just start by saying, I think one of the main things that has struck me um, is how important this is, what we're doing, and um, how distressing it is that there was only one member of the public um, to comment on this. And so I think maybe we should try to put our heads together um, to figure out how to um, how to get more participation. And I know we have had good participation in the public meetings and the comments and I've seen the surveys. Um, when this has come up um, a few times with members of the public, I am telling them this is the most important land use change that we are going through in 40 years. Um, and so I feel like we need to do something more to make sure people understand just how significant this is and some of the changes that are that are being proposed. Um, and, and I think we're going in a really good direction in general. So that was just one general comment. Um, so, so on my specific comments, I really, um, I, I started with the things that that are interesting to me, so I'm not really going in any um, in any order. Um, but I I started looking at the um, design guidelines um, and for specifically for the um, residential flex in the urban high density, the new zoning district that's being proposed, which I think is great. One of the things that um, has always been important to me on this commission is making sure that when we build high density development that we preserve open space. And I think that that's one element I'd like us to think more about as we move forward, um, especially with the RF zone district. Um, in the design guidelines um, specifically, I think this is mentioned on page 13, C6, uh, residential flex sites, um, that, that it's, there is no requirement for open space, there's some requirements for communal open space, but I think that there's something that says uh, whenever feasible, and I'm sorry, I don't have it right up in front of me because I don't have a printed copy of any of this. Um, so I think that that's what I'm looking for is, is some stricter requirements about open space. And I actually see this as an environmental justice issue that if we're building high density, um, high density housing, um, for folks, we have to ensure that this is quality development that's going to attract families that will live their lives in these um, in these buildings. And so that means providing spaces both for kids to play, um, requirements for outdoor space. Um, and I could see maybe being flexible with this if it's within a quarter mile of a, of a county park or, or a, a designated open space for recreation. But I think that it's really important that we retain um, or we, we begin to require um, um, more open space for especially for those high, high density um, uh, developments. Um, let's see. Oh, another, um, another uh, comment that I had moving forward when we get into the zoning discussion for chapter 13 specifically, um, I think also for this zone district in particular, the RF zone, it would be really helpful for me and maybe for other commissioners to um, integrate how the state density bonuses are going to intersect with uh, this new zoning code and the allowances. And then also to have kind of a deep um, discussion or description of one of the significant changes being proposed. And that is um, that it's being proposed that um, developers can calculate gross site area instead of net developable area. This is one of these esoteric um, components that I think is pretty consequential. And so I think it's be really helpful if we all can have a good understanding of what that's going to mean going forward. Um, Commissioner Dan, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Daniel yeah. Siswith. Can you just repeat that last point? Maybe just kind of expand on that just a bit. About the development between 
net site and growth site. Yes, yes. Well, I would rather have planning staff describe. <laughs> no, no, yeah, that's fine. I just, I'm, I'm taking notes and I just wanted to make sure I, I got your thoughts down correctly. Well, Thank you. My understanding is that the way we have, the way we do it now is that there's, there's the whole site, but then we only look at, for development purposes, we only look at uh, the portion of the site that is developable. So maybe like part of the site's on a steep slope and, and our code doesn't allow you to develop on more than a 30% slope. So you can't use that part of the parcel when you calculate how many units you can build. And my understanding is the way that we're, uh, what is being proposed is that you will be able to use the whole site in calculating how many units you can build. At least that's the way I'm understanding it right now. Yeah, let me, um, see if I can clarify a, Did I get a it right? little bit. Yeah, you're doing really <laughs> good. <laughs> um, first of all, I, uh, I want to kind of be clear about what the sustainability update goal is, right? Which is we want to make the most efficient use of our urban land as we possibly can in a way that makes the most sense and integrates into the community in the best possible way. Hence the design guidelines to help with kind of impacts. Um, uh, when you're calculating density and the developments that we've been getting, we're not reaching maximum density ever. We just don't get there unless you have a density bonus um, um, uh, built into a particular project and even then. So um, part of, yes, part of what we are talking about in the urban lands is moving from a calculation that allows you to consider the number of units based on an entire parcel. However, just to be clear, that doesn't mean we're not protecting critical areas, right? They're still, we're not really, um, for the most part, touching any environmental buffers, we didn't dig into Title 16 with this project. So all of the um, uh, provisions that protect our environmental resources are um, still intact. And it's really important for people to understand. Um, and I would also say that even though we're talking about, these are kind of incremental increases in density really, um, we're, we're talking about smaller changes um, that, uh, um, that are really aren't going to result in massive um, amounts of growth. Just building in a uh, little bit more units. Um, and, and it's important to remember as we do that, that all of our other zoning regulations are in place, right? And we'll review more of this as we get to the next session. But there's, you know, there's height, there's setbacks, there's um, requirements in the design guidelines to address massing. Um, and all those things will continue to control for um, the, the impacts to the community, even if we are allowing a few more units. Um, and the other, pretty important thing I want to, to mention is back to the whole RENA discussion, right? So the sustainability update has been um, in, um, in uh, process here for, I don't know, eight, nine years. It's been quite a while. And um, at the time it started and all of, you know, the sustainable Santa Cruz County plan and all of the work that we we're doing in establishment of of our uh, standards, at the time we were looking at a much lower arena. Now we're going to be looking at arena that is approximately three and a half times the number of units. Um, and so we really are going to have to find ways to integrate more units into our community um, without hopefully without extending the urban services line or impacting some of our beautiful protected areas in the county. So building those units into the um, fabric in a, in a way that um, really allows us again to make more um, efficient use of lands in an infill capacity is, is the best way for us to control how we um, accommodate those units. And so 
these changes are, are tweaking almost of regulations to try to build that in in an incremental and sustainable way that doesn't result in massive crazy changes. We're not becoming the city of Santa Cruz or San Jose, right? So I guess I wanted to just make sure we all have the same context here as we move forward. And yes, we will talk more about, about those issues that um, you raised, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, well, let me just comment on that. And let me just like establish that when I'm asking questions or making comments about making sure to include open space in the, in the residential flex does not mean I am opposed to it in concept at all. It only means that I want to ensure that we're going to be building quality units for the people that are going to be living there. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess it's all based on perspective. Um, I think it is quite a huge change to have the RF zone district from where we have before we're going from, you know, 20 units an acre to 40 units an acre. That is a huge change. That doesn't mean that it's bad. In fact, I think that that's good, but I don't think that it's correct to say that it's not a huge change. And I, and I think that it's important for the public to be aware of this. And I think that there's probably a lot of support out there to go in this direction. Um, and I was here for all of the sustainable Santa Cruz meetings and the creation of that plan. I remember that process, I remember the plan. Um, I, there are so many great things in the plan and to see some of that being built into this finally is really gratifying actually. Um, some of the new, especially the transportation elements of it, the, the proposed new roads. Um, anyway, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of good stuff. Um, so in one last, a couple last things, um, in the design guidelines, I think it would be um, important to um, have renderings of what some of the RF um, developments could look like. A lot of the, the photos were, were great, um, but I don't think that any of them represented um, represented what could be built in that zone district and how that could look beautiful and fit into a neighborhood and just what that could look like. I think that I didn't see any photos of any structures that were higher than, than three stories. Um, and then lastly in the plan, I can't even remember where I read this, probably somewhere in the introduction in reference to measure J it's, um, it's in, indicated that it was an initiative and this is a picky thing, but it was actually a referendum. So, <laughs> so thank you. That's um, all I have for now. Thanks. Thanks for those comments. We appreciate them. Um, really quickly before we hear from other commissioners, I just wanted to make sure I, um, that we promote Annie. Uh, I see Annie, I'm, I'm gonna see if I can promote her. I see Annie had her hand raised, um, Stephanie, so I wanted to make sure we had her on the, on the uh, panelist roster here. Um, all right, Annie is now a panelist. I just wanna make sure she was able to speak and she might have had some comments there. Yes, thank you, Jocelyn. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to add um, a few comments onto what Stephanie mentioned. Um, regarding the net versus gross density, there is currently a complex approach, <laughs> like many aspects of our code, for, for we do base it on net developable land, but there's a system whereby credit is provided to many of the categories of undevelopable land, such as 30% slopes in urban areas or repairing corridors. So, so the change from gross net developable land to gross density is actually uh, much less than it might seem. And we can certainly go into more detail on that um, when we discuss the built environment, but I did want to mention that. Um, and then in terms of open space, um, we can certainly clarify that um, in the design guideline perhaps, but there is a requirement for um, for ResFlex that 10% of the land be devoted to open space. There's no requirement for, for lot coverage, so that is a change, but there is still a requirement um, for 10% open space, I think, to sort of acknowledge that it is important for everyone to have access to open space, um, including on those ResFlex sites. So I just wanted to make those two comments. Let 
Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate that. Um, does any commissioners, any other commissioners want to go next? Maybe, Commissioner Lazenby, where are you up next? Uh, well, Chair, I will defer to other commissioners. I think I can Great. get my head around these issues better by hearing the comments from others, and especially the clarification by the staff. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate it. And Commissioner Violante, did you want to say anything before I jump in? Yeah, I was, I was waiting for Commissioner Lazenby. I, I, I just had Great. some small comments. Um, I just want to thank staff for their their work on this. I, as as Commissioner Dan mentioned, this has been a you know, years in the making. I watched as the sustainability plan was developed, and as well as the code modernization. And it's um, really gratifying to see that work incorporated into what is a very comprehensive update to the county code that's been you know decades in the making. To be honest, like as she mentioned, we haven't seen these types of revisions in a long time. And you know, the second district, which I represent. Uh, it includes a lot of the agricultural community in particular that will really see the benefit of some of, um, I think some of these revisions that don't often get some of the attention, um, but we have a code that wasn't really um, consistent really with the agricultural practices that we see today, things like our ag tourism and our um, ag education, as well as even things as simple as farm stands. Um, so I, I agree with Commissioner Dan. I, I will leave some of my comments when we get into some of these more specific pieces of the code, including you know the the, um, the design standards as well as the EAR and things like that. But I just wanted to draw attention to some of the code that often doesn't get our attention um, because uh, we we need to talk about housing and it's important that we did talk about those design standards. But I just wanted to appreciate the work and in that component of the code revisions as well and the agricultural and the code modernization. Uh, because they mean so much to the economic drivers of our community as well. Um, I, I, I'm excited to see some of these uh, divisions that um, develop housing, which can lead to some of these kind of equity issues about providing housing where people live um, through having higher densities in our community. I agree with Commissioner Dan. I, I think it's important as we develop this that we consider the idea that I was interested in one of our polls that talked about what people want within their walking distance. I was surprised that one of the things they talked about wasn't parks and open spaces. And I think it's important that we keep our community green, that we preserve our urban forests through things like that and providing open space and what that can look like on parcels um, is really important as we move forward. Um, but I just really want to take some time to appreciate staff for all their work on this. Um, and I'll wait to get into the specifics. So I'll, I'll defer to Commissioner Gordon as he has additional questions, but thank you to staff so much for your work. Thank you, Commissioner Violante. Um, yes, I obviously I wanna thank everyone also. Um, this is really complicated, really big update for us as a county, which I'm super excited about and good opportunity to clean up a lot of things in the code and get the community's input on, on zoning and other items. And it's so much better to do it at this level instead of the project specific level. And so I'm really glad that we're able to, to do this. Um, and I just kind of second everything else that the other commissioners said. Um, I did have a few comments and questions and, and maybe a little more specific than I should be at this point, but I might say them anyway, just so that you know when they do come up at the next uh, opportunity to talk about some of these, that we can you know have some more time to think through it. And um, again, and you know, mine aren't in any specific order as necessarily as far as the uh, packet went today, but so I'll just kind of jump in. Um, are there area specific plans that are going to get revised as well with this? you know, SoCal or, you know, um, what's that area? I, you know, you know what I'm saying? I want yeah, to there, name them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's um, uh, several area plans. We're not revising them. Um, there are some policies that call for when you have conflicts, how those things are handled. Some of them are quite old um, and uh, could probably use a revision. Um, but it was a little bit outside the 
scope of this plan um, and really needs to be a whole separate effort that involves the community. Um, so, so we've left them in, intact and um, uh, except the one thing to say is that um, there are policies and regulations and the design guidelines that are really meant to implement the, um, uh, the pleasure point commercial corridor uh, plants. So that's the one, the one area where we really are are doing some work to to implement that that plan. Okay, great. Thank you. That's good to know. Um, and then with this, there's a. I know today's general overview. There's some things to come, like design guidelines. Um, and I guess my question was, when we're going to see like the the new zoning map? Does that happen in this process, or is that next year with general plan updates or? Yeah, so um, the this this project is really meant to uh, set up the regulatory and policy framework, um, uh, but we did see an opportunity to um, make some some zoning changes, uh, particularly to start to get the RF, um, the residential flex zone, uh, start to get implemented. Um, so we, we've targeted a, a few properties along our transportation corridors um, that we think are opportunity sites where redevelopment could occur. Um, and, and so it's a very limited amount of zoning map um, and general plan map changes related to that. And we will go over that in our, um, our next session on, on June 8th. So this is just this whole sustainability process just concerning those few properties that are already mentioned. We're not like rezoning the whole county at this point. Okay. <laughs> no, uh -uh. no, mom. But I will say, in kind of creating some new districts, there's not only the residential flex. There's a new workplace flex um, district that's being created. There op will be opportunities for rezonings in the future. Um, if if uh, property owners um, and planning staff want to, you know, see that type of development in a certain area. Great. Thank you. Um, I did have a couple then code specific things that I saw in the packet today that I just wanted to mention. And, you know, I, uh, I don't necessarily have, I mean, I'd like to see them go one way or the other. I think I have an opinion on them, but it doesn't mean that, you know, I, I'd want to hear feedback is really what, I, what I'm looking for. And it doesn't have to be today if there's not an answer, but maybe the next time when we get into these topics, I'd really appreciate to know thought process and like why we're going in certain ways on certain things. Um, one of the changes that was really critical that I saw was the adjustment of the commercial floor area requirement of mixed use project from 50% to 75%, which I think would be really beneficial in creating mixed use housing. Um, but my question is why, is there a reason why we're keeping a 75% and not just maybe something like ground floor commercial and call it at that? Um, and definitely if this is, you know, more appropriate for another time, you can just tell me, hey, let's talk about that at the next hearing on you know, June 13th, 8th yeah, or whatever, we, you know, so. We, yeah. we can talk about it more, but I, I just will say that it's, um, I think it's helpful to have a standard uh, percentage wise, rather than dictating how commercial um, or residential is accommodated on a mixed use site. Sometimes, um, in our area and in other areas, I'm sure you know, we're talking about horizontal mi mixed use. And so, you know, it could be you have a one portion of a site that's residential. And, um, uh, and so we, you know, we feel like it's important to maintain commercial. We didn't want to lose it altogether. There's plen plenty of um, efforts at the state level to try to um, allow uh, complete residential development in commercial zones. Um, and we didn't want to go there. We, we think it's important for people to have services and um, facilities nearby in their neighborhoods. We didn't want to lose it. Um, but we also want to be able to provide some guidance, um, but not dictate. You know, we, want, we don't want to be prescriptive about how they do it. So that's that's the thought process anyway. Understood. Yeah, I appreciate that, especially the horizontal mixed use. That makes a lot of sense, you know, in certain areas, especially. Um, okay. I've read in a few spots, and I just really want to clarify, is the commercial and mixed use zoning FAR 
only going to be one in like all of those zones? Um, I believe so. We'll definitely get into it more next time, but I'm going to okay. ask Annie if she has a thought on that. One, I one believe thing that's... that you oh, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't see everyone, so I apologize. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I believe that's correct, but let me double check on that, Stephanie, and I can um, yeah. report we'll, back in a moment. Okay, and we'll be sure to to address it in the next session. Sure. Okay, that would be one area that I would really want to dig into. I just think that once you get to mixed use buildings with an FAR of one and a story limit of three or you know four plus a density bonus, those kind of things, that you're taking what could be a lot of land and really squeezing down the building into a really short, tall building. And one thing you mentioned just a minute ago was that, you know, we want to make really good, efficient use of the small amount of land that we have. And so, in my opinion, that can kind of open it up to more like parking style developments as opposed to housing or commercial mixed use style developments. And so, I just want to point out that that FER might pose a potential challenge when we get to actually like creating developments based on that standard. Um, my only thought there, thank you. One other question here I had is the R1 designations as it relates to general plan designations of density. So, um, you know, we're, I think what we're saying is that we're gonna transition from, it's essentially gonna be a density per lot instead of a zoning designation. Is that correct? So it wouldn't be like R15, and then an RUM designation, it would be like RUM for the general plan of 7.3 to 10.8 or whatever it is, units per acre. And then that would inform how many units you could put as opposed to having the R15 designation separately. Is that correct? Almost. The, the general plan, um, as required by law, sense, sets out the density um, requirements and and we have made adjustments on the um, uh, the range of density that could be in an R R one zone and any of the residential zones, but you still have the zoning designations and they still have minimum lot size designations and those do not go away. You still have to meet meet both of those. Okay, understood. So that they'll still work hand in hand. And yes. we might see a different zoning density potentially if it doesn't then match the new urban or excuse me, general plan density. Um, mostly for the residential flex zone, um, okay. at which we're establishing new new uh, standards and density for um, those. Uh, as I mentioned before, we really uh, don't see new developments uh, able to meet uh, the highest density uh, levels. So those those standards in the zoning code are pretty important to kind of maintain and, and look at. And we'll we'll spend more time next time. Okay, understood. Thank you. I actually can now see Annie and her hand is raised. I'm not sure if you want, she wanted to chime in on that one. Oh, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Gordon. I, you're correct that the uh, floor area ratio for all the commercial zone districts is one. Okay. Thank you so much for clearing that up. I appreciate that. Um, transportation specific, I just wanted to know if in the future, if there's any opportunity for like bicycle parking strategies, things like that, if that's going to be kind of implemented in those plans, really promoting other forms of traffic other than, than uh, just vehicular. Oh, yes, we okay. have a whole new circulation access and um, mobility element that's really focused on multi modes of transportation. Um, with all new policies and um, that implement um, uh, active trans the active transportation plan that was just um, uh, adopted by the board, as well as a new um, street typology framework. Um, we'll get into that on June 22nd, um, uh, that kind of uh, uh, creates uh, complete streets, 
using a uh, framework that is, uh, we call it kind of a layered street framework where you can't every because we have limited right of way every street can't possibly accommodate everybody and so you um, we have a typology system um, that will kind of label streets by their function to make sure that we're addressing all modes of transportation and I would like to call on Anai Shank who is our transportation planner and is the primary author of all of the policies and codes that we're going to review. And I, I can't see her on my screen, but I think she's here. Hi, yeah, I'm here. There she is. Um, yes, yeah, so Stephanie spoke to some of the policies that we'll be incorporating in the new access and mobility element, uh, which replaces uh, what we formally call the circulation element. We also have um, some pretty substantial changes to the county code related to bicycle infrastructure, specifically bicycle parking. So there's gonna be a huge increase in bicycle parking requirements, um, as well as allowances for vehicle parking reductions for providing more bicycle parking. Um, so we'll talk, as Stephanie said, in more detail about that on the 22nd of next month. That is great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, cool. Um, Let's see. I think that's all the main questions that I have. I am really grateful for everyone's work. I know this is a lot to do and like, especially in light of the new arena numbers, as you were mentioning, this is a lot to really add in and make sure we're, you know, taking it to that next level to meet those goals. And um, yeah, great work. I'm excited to see the next phases and to really continue to dig in. So thank uh, you. It has it. been a ton of work. I know the staff really appreciates your um, the commission's support in in, uh, in this review. And we appreciate the feedback. That way we know what to focus on in the upcoming sessions a little bit. That'll be helpful. Thank you. Great. Absolutely. Did any other commissioners have any final comments or thoughts before we close out on this item? I'd only like to say that if they, there are any ideas of things that we could do individually to help you all as staff to both you know, get the word out or highlight certain elements um, of the project, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much. That, that would be helpful. If, um, if you all know of groups that we haven't reached out to or individuals we haven't reached out to, um, we can work with any of the commissioners or any of the district staff to, to provide more outreach. We, we feel like we've, we're tackling it in a big way, um, but, but as you said, if we can reach more people, um, and we will certainly let you know if there's anything that you all can do to support the project more. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, any other commissioners? Otherwise we can close this item out for the day and move on, so. Okay. Sounds great. Um, with that, then I believe we can close our study session, uh, agenda item number six. I appreciate everyone again, and uh, we'll move on to planning director's report for the today. Today, excuse me. <clears throat> Do we have a planning director's report today, Ms. Drake? Yes, I see. We do have Matt Machado with us this morning. Good morning, Matt. Morning and thank you. Thank you, Chair Gordon and Commissioners. Uh, Matt Machado, your Planning Director. I just wanted to share a really quick update. Uh, we're in budget season and uh, we're planning to present our budget about a month from now to the Board of Supervisors. And uh, just, uh, you know, one of the areas that uh, we're really focusing on is staffing. And so today, uh, our planning group has about 74 people, uh, but before the Great Recession, we had closer to 100. And that loss of staff through that Great Recession, which, you know, through attrition and, and um, some forced uh, cuts, uh, we've been down staff for, you know, it's been 14 years about. And so our mission today is trying to invest additional resources uh, to not only just manage the current workload, which is massive and, and um, 
and a bit overwhelming with the staff we have, which the staff we have are amazing. There's just not enough of them, um, but also to be ready for the future. And so, you know, today's presentation and, and uh, workshop was great. And you, you gave us all a glimpse of the future, uh, but we need to be ready to respond to that, uh, to serve our customers and our community. And so you'll see in our upcoming budget presentation that we'll be starting to focus on adding more staff. We, in our proposed budget, uh, we're proposing to add six new positions. And uh, we plan to do that over the next couple of years to get our staffing levels at the right level to manage the work quantity. So I just wanted to share that with you all uh, to keep you informed and uh, knowledgeable. So that's it for my report and happy to answer any questions, but uh, um, thank you for your interest in the update. And I wanna thank staff for a good presentation today and a lot of, a lot of hard work. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Machado. That's really good to know. Yeah. Um, tough right now, staffing, I think across the all everywhere, you know, it's kind of tough. We're hearing it in a lot of places. So good luck. I really hope that we can find the right people and help continue to grow your staff. I know it's challenging when there's not enough people to do the amount of work that's coming in and these updates, I assume are going to bring a fair amount more work. So best of luck on that. Um, and thank you. Um, any other commissioners wish to comment there before we move on to uh, item number eight? Okay, great, let's do that. Let's move on to report on upcoming meeting dates and agendas. We went over this a little bit, but Ms. Drake, did you have anything else to add? Um, yes, we just wanted to um, inform the commissioners that uh, the next scheduled meeting date of June 8th, so far we have um, a reservation form for a um, continued discussion of an appeal we had from back in, uh, it's been a couple of years, um, on Buena Vista um, Road, the wireless facility. Um, that is on the agenda in addition to one of the study sessions as our policy staff um, informed you of earlier. So we have upcoming um, dates that we do expect to bring items to you for June 8th and June 22nd. Um, and I also wanted to just quickly say that um, at the next meeting on June 8th, I'll be um, cross-training Lizanne Jeffs and our um, department to fill in for me um, on the June 22nd meeting and then also the second meeting in July. Um, she, you all know Lizanne, she was promoted to principal planner a couple of months ago and she is my, um, my co-manager in the development review section. So I'll be taking some vacation and so you will see Lizanne this summer for a couple of meetings. I just wanted to give you some forewarning there. And that is all I have. Great, thank you so much. Appreciate that. There. Um, yes. I actually um, had an item um, to add to our next agenda. Um, I've talked about this with um, David Carlson. I think he's at this meeting. So I'm not sure if you all recall the the Max CKD um, project that came before our commission a couple of years ago. I believe it. Was I was gonna say it was before the pandemic, but I, I can't say that for certain now. Um, I can't remember, it was a few years ago. Um, and that project is actually underway in Davenport. And there have been some, um, some reports of, uh, of dust that leaving the site, I'm not sure how much everybody remembers about the project and I can't really talk about it fully since I'm just wanting to put something on our next agenda, but I think, the, from the concerns that I've heard from the community, what might be um, a good way to approach it would be to ask if staff could return to our commission with a report um, discussing the alleged permit violations, um, mitigations to correct them and other options for our commission should staff find that these violations occurred um, and have not been remedied. And I think that um, Mr. Carlson preferred June 22nd. So um, if that works for him, um, that works for, for me, if that is acceptable to the rest of the commission. 
I think that would be fine with me. Um, could we get some, would we get just a part of this added to the planning packet for that day? Or is there a way to get some of the information prior so I can do a little bit of reading on, on what um, that last hearing was about? I think that last, I think the meeting, Rachel, was one of the very first ones we had remotely at the very beginning of the pandemic, because I recall that one. Um, so it's been a couple of years. Yes. Um, and so, so yes, um, Chair Gordon, you were not here then, I believe. So that was a good comment. We can provide some context and background on what um, the approvals are um, and, and what the action that the Planning Commission took prior and then provide a report back as part of that um, that um, letter to the Planning Commission, I'm guessing is what we will probably be preparing. So um, we can do that. And yeah, that would be something just, we would provide in the packet. Just to, to add, we could also, um, we could uh, let the chair know which meeting it was so he could go back and review that packet and recording as well. That'd be Definitely. great, thank you. And let me just add one more thing. If um, staff um, feels that the issues have been adequately remedied, it would be fine with me if the report was just on consent. Okay. So I would leave that up to your discretion. Got it. Thank you very much. And I did hear from David about that briefly this morning, and I see he is on the meeting. So thank you. Um, could I just clarify something about the request? Sure. Um, is it part of the request to have a, a written staff report on this, um, or would a oral presentation suffice? I, I, I only say that because I'm going to be out of the office for a couple of weeks, um, pretty close to the you know, the due date for any written materials to be published for that meeting. So, um, oh. and, and actually leaving this Friday for that being out of the office. So I'll be out of the office for two weeks. Okay. Um, so I, I could certainly do an oral, def, definitely do an oral report. Not sure how much um, written materials I'd be able to prepare before that meeting though. But I okay. could definitely have something prepared for that meeting. Yeah, that would be fine with me. Okay. But I think, yeah, we've, Yes. Okay. I was envisioning a memo, but if a um, an oral um, report is acceptable, that sounds sounds great. And I just can I just make a statement, Stephanie? I know you mentioned sending it out to Chair Gordon the date of that hearing, but maybe you could send it out to the entire board so that the, even though most of this body was participated in that hearing, I think it might be good to remind them if they feel the need to go back and review, since there won't be a written staff report. Yes, absolutely. We can do that. Thank you. Thank you. And one thing that might be um, helpful to add um, to contextualize why I'm even doing this, um, David, is to maybe attach some of the materials that we have both received and seen from the community. That would then explain why it is that I'm even asking for this, if that makes sense. I'm trying not to have a discussion about the hype. <laughs> yeah, got it. Yeah, so we've received some email correspondence um, plus a homemade video uh, from a resident. Um, so I could try to provide <clears throat> that and explain, the, you know, what our what we've determined from. Um, looking into the um, the complaint. Thank you, thank you, and thank you very much, David. Um, I appreciate um, your availability yesterday to have these conversations. Oh, no problem. Great. Yes, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, if there's no further discussion on that, then we can move to county council's report. 
Good morning. Um, just wanted to say thank you to staff for the great presentation. Um, I think we're all in for a very uh, long and fruitful ride with this sustainability update. I know how hard they've been working. So, um, and it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where we are looking to build more housing, housing and housing and housing is, is always coming up. Um, it's kind of like the, uh, unfortunately, like the serpent chasing its tail, right? We're, we need more staff um, to help us build more housing and, um, you know, to get more staff, we need more housing. So it's a, it's a tough predicament that a lot of jurisdictions are, are going or con confronting right now. Um, but I also wanted to uh, just kind of cheer you on to figure out how do we get more public engagement. I think it's very important kind of echoing what uh, Commissioner Dan had mentioned at the, at the top of her comments. Um, it's really hard to get the public engage in these types of conversations, although these are the types of um, conversations that touch each and every one of their lives. So um, I really encourage you all to kind of think of some some ideas of how we could broadcast this and get more folks in, engaged. But um, I just uh, thank you all for your participation today. Great, thank you very much, appreciate that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we can start, like I know I can start to promote this a little more in my personal, interactions and make sure I'm reminding people that this is coming up and really important. And so I think, you know, little things like that can go a long way also. And um, I appreciate everyone's input on that because it's really important to get as many people involved as we can right now. So um, great. Thank you. Um, if there's nothing else, and that brings us to the end of our uh, session for today. And I appreciate everyone's time and look forward to the next one. And if anyone has anything else, feel free. Otherwise, we can close out for today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Thank Planning you, Chair. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Everyone has a great week. Okay. Bye. Bye.